Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. You're listening to A Bite Of, where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Or the final of the finale of season one, X-Men 97. One last bite. It's one last bite. It's Ugh. part three, but it's our one last bite. It's the finale. We're finally here. Nine weeks. We made it. We're done. <laughs> We've been on so many journeys together, you all. This is another exciting one. Lands far away, times unknown, with mystical heroes abound. Ugh. There's a lot to talk about in this one. Cameos? Cameos? Like cameos just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, why not? They said. <laughs> there's one. If anybody knows me, there's one that audibly freaked out about induced a light screaming as if he saw the Beatles and he was in the sixties better than the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> We're saying controversial things on this pod today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into our conversation on the finale of X-Men 97, some things that are coming up, We're covering Dr. Who. Uh, so, you know, hang around for our episodes on Saturday. Um, next one is episode four. We've done the th- First three so far. Uh, How many episodes are there going to be in this season? I think 10. We're almost halfway through with that already. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So we have that stuff coming out. Um, some movies coming up. So make sure you're following the feed. Make sure you're subscribing. Sending stars our way. Joining our Patreon. We have uh, our X-Men 2000 movies watch through going to be happening this month. So something to look forward to. More X-Men. More X-Men. More. We you have, know what? I'm grateful. Deadpool and Wolverine is coming out. So it's going to be a lot of X-Men. Going for X-Men all the time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. All right. And of course, spoiler warning, this is the final episode of the season. There's a cliffhanger. We don't want to spoil you. So you've been warned. All right. So let us officially take a bite of X-Men 97 episode 10, Tolerance is Extinction, part three, directed by Chase Connolly and written by Bo DeMeo and Anthony Salitti. Charles takes a dip into the depths of Magnus's mind to turn the lights back on on Earth. Phoenix returns to save Cable, but Bastion absorbs his arm to take on a more powerful form. The asteroid's gravity core is destroyed, causing the space rock to plummet to Earth. The moment the X-Men stop the impending collision, the team is whisked away to mysterious places and times. Ooh, places and times. Places and times. Well, we do know. (laughs) Are the places the same? No, they're different. Or are they the same, just in different times? It's not about where, it's about when. But also about whom yeah. is there. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> All right, not to skip ahead too much. Um, there's quite a lot to talk about. Reactions, how are you feeling, I season think as a whole? We what? had a lot of questions going into this, right? We were really wondering how things were going to play out. We were wondering if anybody was going to die, how it was going to leave off. I don't think we necessarily thought the end that we got was the end that we were going to get. So that was really cool. And I think as a final episode, you know, it does that X-Men thing. There's some deep thoughts. There's a lot of cool action uh, and then a cliffhanger. So I think it checked all the boxes that a final episode of a first season should should check. And we know that season two is, I believe the voice work is pretty much already done. So they have a, they have a story, right? And I was very curious how they were going to set up season two. What was going to be the villain? Where was it going to leave them? And they did a good job of leaving us like, Oh, no episode next week. So I'm supposed to wait. Wow. Long. (laughs) Right. And I think as a person who hasn't read the comics, this point, I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. This whole season, we've talked about theories and everything. And Onslaught was a big one, especially towards the end. And it seems like right now, that's not what they're doing. But then again, in the comics, it took a while for like Onslaught to show himself. So who knows what's going to happen to Eric and Charles after them melding minds and taking over and all of that. So that's still on the back burner, but it very much seems like they're setting up Apocalypse to mm-hmm. be the person that's going to be coming forward. But before we get into that part, let's talk about Eric and Charles in this episode. They're of one mind mm-hmm. in this episode. And this is sort of a taboo, right? For Charles to be going this deeply into Magnus's mind and basically telling him, If you don't get it together, I'm going to make you turn the lights back on. Which he does. Which he does. And I think it's an interesting place for us to first join them in this mind meld where they're sitting at a bar, coming out of the mutant closet to each other, and then really just putting those 
very differing views about what it means to be a mutant out there that kind of follow them throughout their journey in their life together. Yeah, I it is really interesting when we get these moments and it's still this is who they are still to this day, right? Even though this wasn't necessarily a flashback, it probably was Mm -hmm. a flashback. And it was nice to see them coming out to each other, which there was a few moments. I'm just going to say Charles leaning in. I'm like, are you guys going to kiss? Like just they wanted us to want them to kiss. It it was it was coded. There were so many things where I was like, I wouldn't be mad at it. I'm just saying I I wouldn't either, <laughs> especially, you know, with uh, Magnus and that younger cut he had going yeah. on. <laughs> but it was great to see how their beginning started and that conversation. And even though they kind of differed in their views for mutants and everything, Eric's upbringing is different than Charles upbringing. And so that really determines how they're going to think of things going forward. But they did agree on one thing that there should be a better society. There should be a better place. Mutants deserve a better life. And that's how they became brothers, Mm -hmm. not brothers. I kiss. Of brothers. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make that distinction yeah. for sure. I One of the things that stuck with me in this conversation is when Magnus says to Charles, run and hide before someone starts dreaming of camps. Yeah. Right. So this, again, we see what Magnus has gone through in his life, how it has shaped his worldview and not trusting people because in his village, they tried to compromise. They tried to be nice, but then they came in with tanks. And I think that this is a very real fear. And I think that even till in real life, I think it can be a fear, right? In us being gay men, who knows what could happen? What horrors might lie ahead if the power goes to the wrong people? And so, you know, Magnus has experienced this. So he's like, Charles, this is great that you're believing in this beautiful world where mutants and humans get along and everybody loves each other. But I'm just letting you know that those differences is what drives people apart. Yeah. And even though, you know, walking Charles's path, it's like you could probably get to a point where it's better, but. People are people. And it's an interesting thing to parallel with what Bastion says later. He said, people are just too damn good. Mm. And it's an interesting viewpoint from both of them. Actually, all three of them. It's like Charles believes that it could be better. Magneto knows it's not going to be better. And Bastion is like, it's too good. It needs to go away. And so having all of these ideals with humanity and as people in a society and how they deal with the others and how you feel as a person in that other society, it's great writing. They did a good job of having all those allegories, all of those metaphors, all of those parallels in this. And I really like being inside of Magneto's mind, not only when he was conscious of it happening and then when he gets his memory wiped, how Charles again has to like bring him back to that point. So it's like he was in the mind. He could have changed things or let it be broken. But the thing of Charles letting him still be himself and coming back to it is really important. I agree. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of metaphoric imagery in this especially with the sort of churning waters outside of this bar that they're kind of having this bigger conversation in and one of the things that charles says is something along the lines of while the tide of the past drags us under it carries us to those who are fighting their own current right and that was kind of a mind-blowing thing to hear of saying like yes magnus you have this turbulent past you have these horrible things that have happened to you, but what you can allow this tumultuous life to lead you to do is to help others who might be going through the same thing. Yeah. And it's such an interesting way of looking at it and not saying, I can't believe this happened to me. The world is screwed up. I'm sorry. Instead, it's, I'm sorry this happened to you. Let it help you help others. Yeah. And Charles, whenever it does get bad and all the waters come in, and it was really touching to hear him say, I have you. I will always have you, even if it brings me down too, which is their relationship at a core. Mm. They're always, even though they're fighting and they've done things that are terrible to each other, they always go back to this moment. Mm -hmm. And it's really touching to see that in the... I did want to point out metaphors and how beautiful this was and the writing was fantastic. I love the part after Magneto gets his memory wiped and we see the boat and it's like the most important people in Magnus's mind, right? It's his children and Rogue. And Rogue. But, you know, he remembers Rogue before Charles, before anything else. And he's like, Rogue? I know her. (laughs) I, I have something to say about Rogue in this episode. She, they all turn real quick. 
They were like super divided. Her and Sunspot were with Magnus. And then once the shit started going down, claws were going through bodies. You know, metal was coming out of people's faces. Everybody was like, okay, we're on the same team again. Oh, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and th- that's the thing, too, about the X-Men. It's This happens all the time, right? They get disassembled. They come back together and they learn from their ways. But I think when, like, at the base of it, all of them will come together mm. and help each other. Right? Yes. Yes. And that's to family. That's what X-Men are. Yeah. You I, can be different. It's your family. I think you don't have any choice to come together when you see the two factions leaders spinning in the air in some sort of psychic grip of love and destiny. You're <laughs> yeah. just kind of like, okay, we got to figure this out. We don't know what's going on anymore. There was a few shots, especially towards the finale. I would say these three, these uh, three parters, there was, it felt very anime like, mm. and that one, when Charles really like psychically blasted <laughs> Magnus, it looked very anime like it was so cool. Yes. It also, um, and you know, avatar, the last airbender is inspired by anime. You know, spoiler alert of Avatar The Last Airbender, the final episode when he's taking away his bending, it is that moment where the power is consuming him and shooting out of his eyes. So it was definitely very reminiscent of that. For yeah, sure. yeah. All the powers and like the face getting distorted from all mm-hmm. the, the power coming out of them. Oh, so good. There's a couple of moments with Cyclops where that happens in this episode as well. I just love it. I loved this episode for Cyclops because I felt like we had, it, you know, this scene that we have with Cyclops fighting Bastion. I know oh. I'm skipping ahead a little, but it really did mirror that first fight from the first episode. We were like, oh, shit, Cyclops is awesome. And then it was kind of like relationship drama for mm-hmm. the next episode. So then for the next eight episodes, so it was really cool to see him back fighting. And it, this fights like that, we'll get more into that fight later, but fights like that really let these characters shine in different ways that even comic book readers might not be able to see them. You know, we've seen in the comic Cyclops fight and stuff and using his laser blast, but seeing it so smooth and fucking cool Mm -hmm. in animation is like, got me real excited for what a live action version of that could be. Absolutely. Because it's like, why just have the guy stand there and just pew, pew, pew. That's not, he's training in the danger room. He should be able to hand to hand Jubilee also showing I can hand to hand combat as well. Come on, guys. I loved seeing uh, Cyclops do that final big blast, which was very reminiscent of the arcade game. Mm -hmm. That was like his big move. And it was like, you know, it can get bigger than just his frames, you know, which is so cool to see. His eyeballs get real big. Oh, yeah. They just take up his whole face. (laughs) He becomes one giant eyeball. (laughs) Yeah. We don't see that, though. It's too much to look into. Our minds would be melted. So (laughs) speaking of Bastion and this. The lead up to this, I would say the whole scene that takes place at this waterfall. Um, so cool. So, so cool. We got Phoenix coming back, which Phoenix, I think the runtime by this time was maybe only 10 minutes when mm. the Phoenix came. And I was like, oh, no, this is another like 30 minute episode. Like, this is it. This is how they're going to solve it. Nope. No, there was so much more that needed to happen. This is just a tiny blip in this episode. Yeah, right at the beginning. So it was really cool to see her come back and her to say. Oh, the Phoenix is the, it's the Phoenix horse is gone. I still feel it. It's like, oh, Gene, it's not gone. Like you've said that before. I'm scared for you because also remember, this is like a wiped clean slate of Gene almost like she hasn't been here for God knows how long. So having the Phoenix come and her being able to control it that easily is a little fishy to me. I don't know if it's like one of those she things came out of the water and he said, fishy. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. (laughs) But I don't know if it's one of those things where her child was in danger. And Mm. so, you know, like moms lifting cars off their kids. So it could be very much that. But it makes me question it a little bit. The way I see Phoenix is if Jean Grey were a gas powered stove, Phoenix is the pilot light that always exists in her. Right. And if it's turned up enough, she can either control it or she can lose control of it. And it seems that this situation just turned the Phoenix up enough that she could, it could take over. She could save everyone. And then she was like, you know, she did do a little bit of a gene faint. Almost. Almost. But she's fine. But she's okay. Yeah. Cable caught her. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also find out that Cable, what did you think of Bastion asking him, how many times did you try to save your mother? 200 times. Not enough. <laughs> That's how I feel. That's fucked up. That even of a number, 200, (laughs) it should have been 872. 
oh, you think he's lying because it was just like a flat number. Yeah, <laughs> exactly 200 times. And this is the one that changes. I don't know, Cable. Something's not adding up. Let's not blame the victim that got his arm taken off and beaten. <laughs> Who, by the way, was just moments before called um, a pup. Yeah. By Mr. Sinister. Yeah, he's just a lab rat to him. He should, yeah, he just yeah. wanted to poke and prod. How did you feel about the um, Mrs. Nesbitt situation? Do you know who Mrs. Nesbitt no. is? Oh my God. Toy Story 1, uh-huh. when Buzz loses his arm and he goes cuckoo bananas and he has that apron on oh. <laughs> and he has a little hat and he's like, I'm Mrs. Nesbitt. <laughs> yes, yes, and of Woody, course. And Woody even beats him with his yeah. own arm. So that's where they got this scene from. Yeah, that was rough. That was a little <laughs> rough. I was not expecting because, you know, at this point, right? So Gene has, you know, made Mr. Sinister body vomit all of the DNA he's stolen. He becomes old man sinister again. She took it away. Yeah. yeah, which is very cool. So you're thinking we're comfortable, right? She even gets the device on Bastion's head. But then when he started wailing on Cable with his own arm... This, you know, Cable's like, I've done this 200 times <laughs> yeah. and somehow it just keeps getting worse. Yeah. And then he just eats it or whatever he does. That was crazy. Yeah, he uses the technology. He becomes incarnate of the future mm. and he uses all that future technology to just upgrade himself, Super Saiyan himself. Yeah. You know what? It is so Bastion that in the episode prior, the X-Men did a little makeover with their costumes He's like, well, watch this. So yeah. first of all, I'm going to have this slick little beard number going on. Got longer. Got longer. And then he's like, you know what? I'll just become more metal and get giant metal wings. Did before, was he like gelling his goatee down and it just like kind of, un- like, I'm just curious why. <laughs> I think it's just the power. <laughs> okay. The power led to hair growth. I mean, we've seen it in Dragon Ball. <laughs> He looked great. (laughs) Menacing and great. Yeah, I really like this upgrade for him. And I like that, you know, even after the Prime Sentinels were all deactivated, we got to see Bastion up his ante a little bit. And it's like, oh, it's not done. Mm -mm. Like, we're far from done now. He's Mm -hmm. still a threat, which is so cool. He actually has had this look before in the comics. So it's crazy to see them, like, jump to that part of it. I'm curious if... I don't think he's dead. I feel Mm -hmm. like in X-Men, just like the X-Men... They're never really dead. They're never really gone. I feel like Bastion could come back up in some way, or we just might be dealing with Nimrod. I don't know, but I don't think he's dead. We didn't see him die. That's never a good sign. I think, unfortunately, he's going to be in some other time where Mm. he can maybe glom on to someone and they can be extra villainy together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he might find another apocalypse and be like, hello, well, I'm Bastion. We're best friends now. That's a good point. Maybe he's going to go with where Nimrod is. I don't know. There were so many ways that I thought this season was going to end. And even as this episode was going and by the end of it, I was like, I have no idea. Mm. Like there's so many storylines that they're doing. And I'm like, this could be anything, anything. I feel like it is going obviously towards apocalypse, but like, apocalypse is like the thing that's always there so what is going to keep driving this oh i'm so excited yeah i really honestly have no idea and the fact that part of the team is with sort of young apocalypse Mm -hmm. the other part of the team is with an an apocalypse that isn't necessarily existing and then there's apocalypse in present day genosha it's like what's happening yeah it's a it's a lot we can't forget that morph did do one more clap back at Sinister before oh, yeah. the season ended. It looks the same to me when he turned in his face. Oh my God. I love them so much. Morph is just the, ca- like Morph is, I think solidified themselves as the comedy oh, yeah. of this. You know, oh, yeah. we needed a little break. We saw that we had to acknowledge how ridiculous Mr. Sinister looked and Morph was there to help us realize it. Well, with Gambit gone, we needed somebody to, you know. Yeah, that's true. Have some jokes. I do like that because Mr. Sinister knows Morph, obviously, because he tortured them for years, he runs up to him and is like, show me my face. Yeah. <laughs> and Morph's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, he just showed him his face, yeah. what it actually looks like. But like, Mr. Sinister knows that Morph can be his mirror if he needs it. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> so this leaves us with Asteroid M being disabled. Mm. And then also the Magneto protocols happening. Yes. Yikes. So there's a lot going on in this sort of second chunk of this episode. Lots of glimpses. Yes, but and but the fighting was really 
phenomenal. I so mean, good. the first scene that we get is Rogue just literally clapping back at Bastion. That shit was sick. I, I, you know, it's interesting. Like looking back at this season, it's always like when you have a team like this, who is the focus? And I really feel like the Summers and Rogue mm-hmm. were the focus of this season because Rogue had moments, like not just like a moment, moments in this season. And I love that. I love that I didn't expect going in to be like, this is a Rogue heavy season. I was expecting, you know, a bunch of other people, maybe even Wolverine at the start. And I'm glad it wasn't. I'm glad that Rogue really got her moment to shine in this season. Next season, depending on what happens with Gambit, it could be more Rogue (laughs) coming in. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I Rogue feels like one of those characters that everyone loves. Mm -hmm. There's just something about her that you can't not. I mean, she just has everything going on. And in this scene in particular, you know, we still see that she is obviously mourning the loss of Gambit, you know, as fresh. she's coming to punch Bastion in the face, she says his name was Gambit. Remember it. Ooh, call back. That's like the if you're sitting in the theater, everybody cheers out loud. I moment. mean, we we clapped. Yeah, we clapped. <laughs> and, and then, you know, he grabs her by the neck and you can see how powerful Bastion actually is because we know how strong Rogue is. He's punching his arm and nothing is happening. Yeah, I love that they didn't make her whole thing about not being able to touch people and mm-hmm. everything a, a thing all season right because i feel like that is one of the more annoying things about rogue we saw it in the movies constantly oh i can't do anything because i can't touch anybody it's like that's not just do, do something you know yeah so in this having her fully capable and fully being able to do what she needs to do was very exciting to see and we got moments like that where she just one-on-one with bastion and then sunspot officially Toe to toe. toe. Yeah. Toe to toe. Right. Yeah. So good. That was really cool. And I like seeing Sunspot now sort of in this fight, solidify himself as a part of the team, as a main character. I felt like throughout the season, we were really trying to feel him out. I feel like he wasn't necessarily an X-Men yet. Right. But in this, having him and Rogue work together to fight Bastion, it felt very much like he's come into his own And now he's officially a hero. Yeah, he worked really well with them. There was multiple parts in this episode where the X-Men had to work together and just happened to work together, right? The big thing of trying to not make the asteroid fall on Earth, they all had to work in unison. That was a plan. But in this fight in particular, it was really cool to see them on the fly working together. And that's what I hope so much when we get an X-Men movie. I think I said this in like the first episode when they first fought the Sentinels. I want to see that. I want to see them working together because they're a family. Mm. They live together. They train together. They should be able to do this right. And so Cyclops got his moment, right? Seeing Nightcrawler and Jubilee work together. So cool. Of course, Nightcrawler would teleport Jubilee around so she can hit him and not get hit. That just makes so much sense. I'm also pretty sure that there were a couple of times where Nightcrawler was bamfing around Bastion and he had like a wrench and he was just clonking him in the head with a metal wrench, which I love. When you are Nightcrawler, anything and everything, throw at him. Swords, awesome. (laughs) Wrench, got it too. Can also do the job. And we, again, you know, one of my major through lines of this season is watching Jubilee grow. And I think we get that here, right? We see her achieve that move that she learned from future jubilee in Mo- i don't motendo Mojo. i always want to say well, mojo tendo it's n- <laughs> motendo <laughs> instead of nintendo it's motendo mojo jojo sure tendo not the same thing <laughs> no but she does do that really cool thing that she learned from future jubilee yeah it's that. like the the disc of fireworks yes yeah it was pretty pretty badass she clipped his wings yeah oh he I broke her it. glasses. Yeah, that's true. Oof. Seeing her have power after he said, what are you going to do? Slay me with the 4th of July, which is, I mean, she might have heard it before. I haven't. I loved it. <laughs> it was a roast. And he <laughs> roasted like, her. Good job, Bastion. Like yeah. that one. High five. <laughs> I mean, let's talk. Let's go back to Bastion. I mean, he's like super strong, but he is a petty little bitch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, by the way, they're like Bastion. Professor X wanted to save you. What don't you understand? I think it's one of those things where he knows that, but he's too far. Mm. Like, what is he going to do? Oh, okay. Can I join the X-Men now? You know, 
that's just not going to happen. And he does say a few times in this episode and sprinkled throughout where he talks about, you know, mutants being born and who they are and everything, but he was born with this programming, Mm. right? If Charles would have gotten him at a young age, would that have helped? You know, I, I would think so. I would hope so. But there is that question of, was he just made to be this way, which right. is unfortunate, but I don't know. I mean, the thing for Bastion is that there is a mechanical part to him, but there's also a human part to him. Right. And so would Xavier have been able to work his X magic, you know, and, and make him realize who he could be? And I do love that it was Scott and Storm. It wasn't just Scott. I've seen a lot of people like, oh, Scott, like really blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, Storm also was part of that conversation. And they talk about. Instead of killing Bastion, instead of going too far, he's going to do what they've been talking about, right? Embracing the future, right? To work with it and not just being scared of it, right? And they try. They do do the olive, olive, olive Blanche. (laughs) (laughs) The olive branch was extended to him and too far gone, man. Yeah. His jaw was halfway gone. His eyeball was popping out. Well, no way. Yeah. When he popped up and he kind of like put himself back together with the green ooze coming. You're like, he's just too far gone. Yeah. He's not going to acquiesce to to this, the X-Men. It's not good. And then we have the other thing. This episode did a good job and it was, it was a lot like episode five where things just kept happening and happening and pushing them further into the conflict. And so with the Magneto protocols being done, pretty much just destroying asteroid M and destroying the gravity drive and all of that. I liked that when we saw Iron Man, which was fun. Did nothing, said nothing, but he was literally back. said nothing. That was Stony Tark if I've ever seen him. <laughs> Just doing nothing at all. And then we also had Steve Rogers, which did try with T'Chaka saying, maybe let's like not, you know, do this. I liked that they gave him that because it did feel very much like in the episode with Rogue, he was being a cop, right? Mm-hmm. And so is there going to be tension with? The Avengers and the mutants at some point later on in the future, there is Avengers versus X-Men. It is a thing that's happened. So it's going to be interesting to see how the public and also the Avengers handle the X-Men whenever Mm -hmm. they come back or currently. Um, But it did seem like the X-Men have gotten a little more favor in people because they all saw them trying to stop the asteroid from hitting Earth. Yeah, I was really annoyed because stupid president unleashing the missiles that then ended up causing the X-Men to have to save humanity again, even though they tried to just kill them again. Poetic. So annoying. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, they, oh, okay, thanks guys. What do you, what are you gonna do you do? Yeah. 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 It's, it's awful. Just, it's let's, stupid. Let's also take a moment to just reflect on some of the other cameos that we saw in this moment. Okay. Um, Daredevil pops up. Getting thrown into a shop. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then who comes out of the window of the shop? Cloak and Dagger. Ugh. Okay. There are three cameos in this that I audibly was freaking out about. Cloak and Dagger was one because never would I ever have thought they would have shown up. Very good. Watch the show. It's actually really good. Um, hope to see them and the MCU at some point. Seeing Doctor Strange because I love Doctor Strange. But also, <laughs> I love that it's Doctor Strange. He's doing surgery, so he has everything prepped, but he still has the cape and he's doing magic. And it's like, I felt like they were like, you have to have the cape because people won't know. Totally. (laughs) It's Doctor Strange. I like Doctor Strange (laughs) saying, like, everybody's like, Doctor, there's no electricity. There's no power. We can't do this surgery. He's like, no, scrub up. Yeah. I'm Doctor Strange. Wee wee. You know, you can still do it even though there's no power. Or yeah, like that. I, it was so funny to see him doing surgery and mostly his get up. Yes. And then my favorite one, because I will always freak out anytime they show up. But Morph turning into Mr. Fantastic. Oh, my God. I loved it. Yes. More. Mr. Stretchy. <laughs> Give me the Fantastic Four. <laughs> the, the thing that's kind of a little like hard to realize is that in, in the actual MCU, Mm-hmm. Right. We're we're building these teams. We're introducing these people in X-Men 97. They're all there already. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like the Avengers are there. Cloak and Dagger are there. Daredevil is there. It's just like Miss, the Fantastic Four exist already. It's one of those things where a lot of these characters and teams and everything showed up in the shows together. And it was just back then. It wasn't a big deal. Right. You know what? I mean, it was a big deal for them to show up, but it wasn't a big deal for them to 
be connected or not connected. It was just fun. Like the X-Men are in New York. Of course, they're going to run into Spider-Man. Right. So now it's a little harder, right? Because we've gotten 10 years in the MCU with no X-Men, no Fantastic Four. So us being, oh, this is a connected universe. How do you introduce them? Mm -hmm. Where have you been? Right. So it's going to be interesting how they do that. It does seem like they're very much doing it where we've seen these characters in the multiverse and something might just smash them all together. Right. Because Which I would say is the easiest way out. Yeah. Because it, right. I'm trying to think at the end of the Marvels, we see beast. Correct. In and now another universe. Yeah. And now we're going to have Deadpool and Wolverine. Yep. Together. Yep. Causing mayhem in the multiverse. I don't know. This multiverse. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know, I, I always go back to this. Just Loki's sitting there. Yeah. Holding the branches of dime. So that's why this is a little easier because it's yes. like, yeah, they just, they're all there. They're just there. They're there. And I love it. And yeah. it's exciting whenever it happens. But also, can you guys help? For the love of God, the rest of you help the X-Men. Oh, no. <laughs> like, no, I don't know what they're doing. Call, what were Cloak and Dagger doing? Call for help. Yeah. <laughs> they need to call for help. Everyone on their own. <laughs> so they stop the meteor. Magneto wakes up. Magneto lives. Magneto was right. Magneto lives. I want all of them on a t-shirt, on a mm -hmm. blanket. I need all of it. And then they vanish. What a way. It looked gorgeous. It, you know what it looked like? Tell me. It looked like Cable's body sliding effect. Mm. That purple, blue, white. That's what it looked like. I don't know if they're just using those colors for like time travel slippage. Mm. But that's what it looked like. So somebody from the future or something through them in time and it is really interesting the teams that they separated like scott and gene being with young future nate and mother ascani who is spoiler if nobody wants to know fast forward also the offspring of scott and gene right rachel um this is where it gets interesting because so we see apocalypse we've seen him in the opening credits right a few times cable fighting him and whatever else is happening so seeing them all be at different points with Apocalypse, mm -hmm. it seems very much like they're going to the age of Apocalypse, which is a big event and big storyline. But then you have like the Messiah complex and you have all of these other things. So I'm really interested to see how they'll meld them together. And it kind of makes sense to take a lot of the Apocalypse stuff and put it together. And so season two, I'm thinking it's going to be like different timelines told in a linear, same, yeah. you know, which... It's kind of exciting. I'm so I guess what I'm curious about is one who has brought them there. Right. And what's the purpose of bringing them there? Is it to stop apocalypse from rising to power? Mm. Right. Are they sending that big team there so that they can stop him? Right. But then, you know, what's with the family summer's reunion? Yeah, that's in really interesting. It, well, it does seem like Mother Ascani. And the clan, the Ascani clan, are trying to overthrow some type of place mm -hmm. that does look like it was the utopia that Apocalypse had. So it very much seems like a war of apocalypses is going to be taking place at different times. But one of the most important things is the Gambit card that present day Apocalypse found. In the comics, the Apocalypse has four horsemen, of course. The Apocalypse is coming, there's four horsemen. And Gambit volunteers to be death mm -hmm. for Apocalypse. This is interesting. It doesn't seem like he's volunteering. It seems like Apocalypse is just going to kind of bring him back and make him death. Yes. And we've already seen this. Charles saw this in the classroom with the Shi'ar people mm -hmm. when Gambit came up and he was death. That's right. So he already saw it. He got a little premonition of that. He, and so did we. Oh, Charles, he knows everything. <laughs> yeah. He's just a little bit of a know-it-all. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to say that sometimes one of my least favorite tropes mm. is a good guy being brainwashed or whatever into becoming a bad guy. Yeah, I feel like they're going to handle it well, but it is one of those things like, OK, we know he's going to be good again. So, yeah. like, how is that going to work? Exactly. And so I think you always sort of know the journey of that character. So it's just going to be like annoying until you get there. Right. Right. I just want them. I want Rogue and him to kiss, even though they're not allowed, but, but I want them to. But with Gambit seemingly being a horseman, right, it's Rogue is going to be a big part 
I would say going forward and she's going to have to deal with that. So that I'm, I'm excited to see that. I mm. love it. Those kind of conflicts or those character developments and challenges they have to go through. I'm excited to see that, but I just, I do want Gambit to making beignets again. Yeah. For the love of God. Please. <laughs> and then I want him to get a little makeover. Everybody else got a little yeah. makeover. What's Gambit's makeover? Evil. That is true. Oh, yeah. Evil. That's it. That's his makeover. Scythe. <laughs> I did love, I was, I mean, we did end up having that sort of after credit scene or mid credit scene, but I love that almost the final words of the season were Beast going, oh dear. Oh Yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic. It was so good. He, of course, he had to mention the Trojan horse. He had to say that it was a perfect way to like end pretty much the season with Beast doing what he does best. Just getting those one liners in there. That's like, right. That's what he do. It's <laughs> either that or he's frantically typing on a keyboard. Yeah. So they gave him the, the final line of the season. So one of the things that we do have to talk about, I was bringing up the image here. Um, so Forge is like the only X-Men left in the current time, I believe Jubilee and Sunspot, Jubilee and Sunspot are also there, but they're not there when we see him. Right. And Bishop comes back and they get to meet for the first time, which is really fun. Um, and he's the one that says they're lost in time. Of course, he would know. It's, it's sort of he funny. lost Nathan. <laughs> he always he's always losing people. He's yeah. like, whatever. It's a Tuesday. I do like Forge's like, who do you think you are? Meanwhile, they're wearing matching outfits. Right. <laughs> 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 who are you who are you in your golden blue obviously an x-men hello <laughs> um so i brought up the the picture just to clarify in my mind yeah what this is saying so all of our members that were on this are presumed dead or missing aka through time but we also see some other ones on here so it shows quicksilver and wanda it says off world, off world. yeah which is very interesting i do know bo de on twitter has said there's a reason for it saying that. So where are uh, Magneto's children and what are they doing? Mm -hmm. But we also see on there X-Men or X-Men, Iceman, Havoc, Shadowcat. I need Shadowcat back in here. Emma Frost, which is like, where are you? Can you help? Do something. She's trying to figure out how to change her lip color. Mm -hmm. And um, Colossus. They're all fine. Mm -hmm. It just has, a, oh, and Exodus is on here too. They just have nothing. They're alive. They're well. So, and dust. Dust is on there. Dust is cool. She turns into sand. <laughs> to dust. You know, and that's why I love those names so much. Sometimes mm. they just tell you exactly what they do. So we have um, quite a mystery to solve. I wonder if some of these people that are on this board, they're going to come in as the team in the present day. Yeah. While everybody else is sort of the out. rescue squad. Yeah. And I'm interested to see where Jubilee and Roberto sort of land in all of this. You know, Jubilee's just getting busy turning into a vampire. It's fine. Vampire? She does get turned into a vampire in the comics with uh, that outfit. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I don't think they're going to do it, but <laughs> it does happen. <laughs> I mean, she'd be a pretty cool vampire. Yeah. So final thoughts. Oh my God. We didn't mention. We harped on Morph and Logan so much. We didn't mention their scene together. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. So Logan in this whole episode oh, is yeah. just out of it. He had all the antimantium ripped out of him. So Morph turns into Jean and tells Logan, I love you. Uh, you know what? He, like, they, he, no. They said, I can't say it, but she can. Why Which can't is, you say it, Morph? Because Logan is a straight man and Morph is clearly in love with Logan. It, listen, Logan, <laughs> Logan has to know on some level that Morph has feelings oh, for I, him. I'm sure. I mean, Logan in a different timeline is in a relationship with Hercules. Like there is a bisexual gay Logan out there. So just like make this one. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. But, you know, I it's such a sweet and tender moment. And we all I can only hope that Morph has a love interest in the next season that can reciprocate. But it doesn't go well. Like, don't fall for the straight guy, Morph. <laughs> also, who's dying? Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to be Feral? Yeah. I'm saying. Also, that leads me to my next question. Where's Wolverine? I think he was with them. I think he was still, like, out of it, wasn't he? Who had him? Beast, um, was, Beast was carrying Professor X. Was Morph with them? Morph was with them. But where was Wolverine? Interesting. Uh, somewhere. All right. <laughs> I actually don't think I remember seeing Wolverine. I don't know. Let us know. 
Yeah, where was you're... Wolverine? Yeah, I don't want to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> I did get the chills watching it a second time and some yeah. of the stuff that happened. Yeah. It was it was a lot. It lets you be able to sit in there yeah. and like really look at it. Oh, so good. Phenomenal. All of the people that worked on this, such a good job. This is this is what the X-Men are about. This is what we deserve to see, like when they're doing stuff with it, right? We're not, let's not go back to the old animated stuff of it just being like mm. <laughs> this is cool this is i'm so excited for their future animation properties let's go yeah and i mean who knows maybe they're doing a cloak and dagger project i would love that right and that's why they would kind of bring these characters that you would never expect in yeah i'm, I'm curious to see what happens with daredevil because daredevil seems to be the live action one seems to be the um gateway for all of the like cw mm-hmm. slash netflix slash was it CW? Yeah. Way to bring them back into the MCU. I'm still holding out for Jessica Jones. Kristen Ritter has been teasing the hell on social media, and I need to know. Her hair was purple. Her hair was purple. Mm. <laughs> so very excited for season two. I'm patiently, impatiently going to be waiting for it. Yes. I think that this final episode of the season really did sort of end some chapters. Mm. But now we just have a whole new one that we have no idea where it's going to lead just like cable sitting in the diner by himself one arm we're left with some kind of closure before the next chapter that was a really sweet scene it was oh i love the summers they're so messy but they love each other they only they're only ever good right before they're going to end yeah it's ridiculous hey you know what you made it right before the finish line (laughs) you did it you did your best kids (laughs) yeah all right so let us know yeah what you thought of the finale, what you thought of the season as a whole. Thanks for being on this insane ride with us this whole time talking about the X-Men. Who would have thought we'd be talking about the X-Men? It's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. (laughs) Now jump in the TARDIS with us and come along (gasps) on our next adventure. Doctor Who. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Till next time. Bye. 